Jim does want me to introduce him, and uh, he doesn't need an introduction. When I was a second year law student at Temple Law School, and clerking in uh, Richter, Lloyd, and Levy, we all knew he was going to be great then, and he became greater than, all, than we all thought he was going to be. He's somebody who has done it all. The reason I'm standing up here now, Jim, is also because we've got to change the, I know you're anxious to get started, I'm going to sit down. <laughs> I can feel the pressure from you. But we, our other, is a film in? I just wanted to say one thing. Here's a man who has a national reputation, still comes out to lecture to lawyers in Philadelphia where he started, has been recognized by his peers, who's who in American law, who's who in the world, who's who in America, who's who men of achievement. The only thing that you haven't made, Jim, really is who's who in yeshiva. <laughs> You're not going to make that one. Jim Beasley. June 2nd, 1980. It's been a warm, sunny day. It's 8.30 in the evening. You're in the living room of Mr. and Mrs. Guineer's home. Joe Guineer and his wife are sitting out in the front stoop. The phone rings. Hear Joe say to Mrs. Guineer, I'll get it dear. We see Joe come in and he picks up the phone. Yes, my name's Joe Guineer. Are you the father of Joseph N. Guineer? Yes, yes I am. But who's calling? your son at home? N no, he's not, but, but tell me, who's calling? This is the Lower Makefield Township Police. I'm sorry to tell you, Mr. Guineer, your son is dead. And Joe steps back. And he looks at the phone. He said, who, who is this? What happened? Your son was killed this evening, about an hour ago, in an airplane crash. Joe puts down the phone, unbelieving. His legs are rubbery. His heart is beating fast denies it. There must be a mistake. Not my son, not my oldest son. And we step back and we watch him slowly walk to the front stoop and bring Mrs. Guineer in. It is the beginning. It is the end. Before we go further, we must go back, back to 1966, and we have to go 2,000 miles away to Wichita, Kansas, and we're standing out on the ramp of Cessna's production line, and we see a hangar door open to see an airplane, a brand new airplane, 3847 Lima, roll off the production line and out into the sun of a Kansas afternoon. It certainly is a pretty airplane and it smells fresh. And it smells new, 
and it smells of death. 1966, Joe Guineer was four years old. The airplane was brand new. It sits on a ramp in Wichita, Kansas, and Joe Guineer is playing in the street in South Philadelphia. Where were you? That airplane would bring us, each of you, Mr. and Mrs. Guineer, myself, to this very moment in time. In 1966, that airplane, on that afternoon, controlled the destiny of the Guineer family and you. And here we are. There is another telephone call that will be made. Before we get to that, let's go to June the 2nd, 1980 to Cape May County Airport. And let me shepherd you through what happened that day. We're standing on the ramp. Standing somewhat back and we can see 3847 three, Lima sitting on the ramp, tied down. Look over there. There you see Mr. Harper's car coming into the airport. And a stop. Mr. Harper's getting out. And out of the car also come some young, happy men. Mr. Harper's very proud. He's taking his son and his son's friends for an airplane ride. How proud he is. He's made everything in life that he wanted to do come true. And he's especially proud because he has his son with him. You better step back because Mr. Harper and the boys are walking over to the airplane now. And you see Mr. Harper pull out the checklist. And you see him very carefully and methodically go through that checklist and he's checking everything on that airplane that is supposed to be checked and would be checked by a very careful and prudent pilot. See them tie down, it's removed. You see him help the boys get in the airplane. Uh, there's Tom Canuli, he's sitting on a right or uh, left rear seat in Joe Guineer. You see him get in first and he's going to be sitting, as you know, on a right rear seat. And Brian, Keith's son, he's getting in the right seat and you see them strap on their seat belts and you hear Mr. Harper tell them be sure the doors close, Brian. You got your seats, belts? What about you, Tom? What about you, Joe? You all buckled in back there? And then you see him reach over to the throttle and you see that propeller start. But you better get back a little bit now because he's going to turn and we don't want a lot of dust and dirt blown over us. And you see him taxi out. You notice that building over there, that small building? Well, Mr. Skull is sitting in there, so let's go over there. Because that small building where Mr. Skull is seated now, and he mans a microphone where he can talk to the airplanes that are on the ground or in the air. Let's go over there. As we walk over there, we can notice that Brian and Keith and Joe and Tom are taxiing the airplane down to the end of runway 28. Runway 28 happens to be the active runway this day because the wind favors that runway. And as we get over to the building that Mr. Skull is in, we can look down and have a clear view of that runway 
and we see Keith Harper's airplane taxi into the takeoff position and he announces over the radio 3847 Lima is ready to take off I'm going to make a left hand turn out and us, you, Mr. Skull watch 348 Lima go down the runway gently lift off into the air and start making a left turn what do you say we hop in an airplane real quick all seven of us and let's fly formation on Mr. Harper's airplane we can see him going out over the marshes and towards the Wildwood Beach and you see him turn and go along the shoreline and you can you can almost see if you look very carefully the young men laughing and joking and waving and pointing to the things that they're seeing below and you know that Mr. Harper is very proud and then there's a gentle bank of the airplane as it turns inward toward the land and look very carefully down there do you see it? there on the top of that house there's a little shed and there's somebody waving waving a white towel and look there's Mr. Harper thanking his airplane wings ever so gently that's Mrs. Harper you can almost hear Mr. Harper say Brian there's your mother see see mom down there and it continues back to the airport <clears throat> time is slowly running out he announces Cape May County Airport this is 3847 Lima I'm coming straight in let's follow him well he's doing everything just the way he should the airplane starts a gentle descent you can see him put on 10 degrees of flaps you know that he's put on a carburetor heat the engine is slowing down a little bit more his descent is perfect he's about a hundred foot from touching down on the runway and all of a sudden reason that we don't know he starts to go around you know that he's put the carburetor heat in so he has full engine power you see him put the throttle forward and then the airplane takes a precipitous nose up if we were in the airplane at that moment as Mr. Canuli told you without any warning the seat that Mr. Harper was sitting in came violently back with such force that it broke Mr. Canuli's left leg and as it came back he had the stick in his hand and that too came back and we know at that moment that that airplane was going to assume an attitude which would make it impossible for it to keep flying the nose goes up and the airplane goes to the right we can hear the people in there screaming the airplane goes over and it crashes into a wooded section off of runway 01 there's silence there's no noise Perhaps there's a bird that if you listen carefully you can hear it. And we run over to Mr. Skull's building and Mr. Skull is on a telephone with the Lower Makeshift Township Police and the Coast Guard. An airplane has gone down, an airplane has crashed, we need help. Send it immediately. And within a few minutes we can hear, beginning to hear, the wail of a siren approaching the airport. I know, there it is, there's the car. 
coming into the airport. It's a Lower Makefield police car, and we recognize the driver. It's Officer Martin. He comes in, and he drives down the runway, but he can't locate the airplane. The wooded area is very dense, and he calls for help. You better get a helicopter out here because I can't find where this airplane is. Shortly afterwards, a half hour, the helicopter appears overhead and you can hear the flipping of those blades in the air. And the fella reaches out and he points down. And Martin looks up and he sees them. And he starts to run. He's got an emergency aid kit with him. And he runs into that wooded area. And it is dense, difficult to get through. You can see the branches scraping and tearing at his clothes. And you can see the struggle he is as he goes through this dense area looking for this airplane, looking for these people. And it becomes more dense. There he just scratched his cheek on a, on a briar bush. And he gets through and we're following him and we can hear the brushes scratch at his clothes and we can hear him continue to pant and pant more and more as he struggles to run his hardest to get there as quick as he can. Now wait a minute. We begin to see something. My God, we're almost on it. There it is. It's no longer gleaming. It's no longer pristine and clean. It's mangled and it's upside down. And wait, we can smell gasoline. My God, what's going to happen? Officer Martin continues on. He gets there, he tears open a part of the airplane. And there's Keith flying beside a strut. Officer Martin kneels down, opens up his first aid kit, and he takes one look. And he knows that he's dead. And Brian, who was in the front seat, he too is in a distorted position. And he looks at Brian, but at that moment, at that moment we hear, yes, it is a moan. Somebody is alive. Somebody is moaning. He turns his attention quickly. And hanging from the seat belt, from the right side of the seat is the Joe Guineer. And he's moaning. Officer Martin reaches, feels his pulse. It's faint. It's thready. He begins to use CPR. And he works on Joe for three or four minutes. And then finally, Joe's breathing better. His pulse is strong and it's steady. Then he turns back to Brian. Brian, too, is dead. Then he turns to Tom Canuli. And when he sees Tom, he doesn't feel too well. Tom's face is so distorted by the injuries that it's impossible for him to perform mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. But Tom's pulse seems okay. Then there's some more moaning. Then he pays attention to Joe again. The pulse is thready again, and it's weak. And he tries desperately. Guineer died at that instant in the arms of Officer Martin. He helped Tom Canuli out of the airplane. We stand there and we watch and we look at that distorted wreckage of metal and humans and we then see some fire people arrive begin to remove the bodies. They go to the morgue. And Officer Martin picks up the telephone. 
and he calls Mr. and Mrs. Wenier and he tells them what happened. I have the airplane here. You've seen it. I want to go back again with you for a period of 14 years to this airplane and other 100 series airplanes flew this country. The 55 172s. It's about 120,100 series airplanes that have a seat of identical construction as the seat which led to the terrible events of June the 2nd, 1980. I will not this on your time by reviewing the 10 NTSB reports where pilots in the past have been killed as a result of seats of this nature coming off the track and causing a pilot to lose control of the airplane. Nor will I trespass on your time in going over all the alerts which repeatedly brought to Cessna's attention the inherent danger of these seats. I will discuss with you what it is. As a minimum, you are entitled to. Indeed, I have the burden of proof. And I welcome that burden. I have a burden of proof on the compensatory damage issue, in this case, <coughs> by a fair preponderance of the evidence. What is a fair preponderance of the evidence? In Philadelphia, to have American stores. They were yellow stores that sat on a corner in most neighborhoods. And if you were to go in there and say to the grocer, I'd like to have five pounds of beans or sugar or whatever it is, would take a five pound weight, put it on one side of the scale, take a bag, and take a scoop, and he would fill that scoop with sugar and he would pour it into the bag until those scales were in equilibrium. At that moment, the bag weighed exactly five pounds. Supposing that he were to turn around, reach his finger into that sugar bin or that bean bin and drop it into the bag. Just that imperceptible few grains into the bag would now cause the preponderance be in favor of the bag and against that weight. Even though it may be imperceptible, the bag would still weigh more than five pounds. That's the burden of proof. And I will show you, as I've already shown you by the factual situation, as I related it to you and as you know it to be and as Cessna knows it to be, that we will put in more than just a pinch of sugar. I have produced for you quality testimony about which there can be no dispute. The qualifications of the men that I called were not questioned by Cessna. 
not in the slightest, nor could they question. They told you the defect. We didn't tell you that we had a better idea as to how that seat should have been constructed. We constructed a better seat. We brought it into the courtroom. We put an individual in that seat and we let him demonstrate for you the defect that existed in the Cessna seat and the absolute safety of the seat which we produced, which we designed, and which was readily available to Cessna during this period of 14 years that this airplane was needlessly costing lives of people. Come, members of the jury, I want you to come out of the jury box, and I do have your permission to do this, Your Honor. I want you to come out of the jury box because I have this airplane here, and I'm going to point out things, and I don't want anybody standing up looking over somebody else's shoulder. I want you to see it firsthand. Because when you go to deliberate, this courtroom is going to be closed and the entire courtroom will be your jury box because that exhibit will be here for you to touch, look at, and analyze, and I want to help you do it right now. So come down here, that's it. Spread around here, be careful you don't trip over that wheel fairy. Now you see, why this airplane crashed on this day. There is a ton of other evidence that I could introduce you to in detail. But you know that evidence as well as I do. What is it in face of this overwhelming against Cessna, what is it that Cessna tells you it is by way of their defense a request for a verdict in their favor? Did you hear a single word from any engineer in Wichita? You heard from two experts house, not part of the engineering crew at Cessna, not from Wichita, from Florida. Men who are paid $80 an hour, porter to portal, to come here and tell you that what is obvious, what is wrong, is not so obvious and is not so wrong. You like the quality of that testimony? Let me ask you this. When you go into the jury room, you may leave your coats outside, but you don't leave your common sense outside. You take that in with you. Does it make sense that Cessna is willing to pay $80 an hour for experts who neither investigated any of these accidents have never talked to a pilot who has complained of a seat slipping and who only recently took the time to view this wreckage. Indeed, you have spent more time looking at this wreckage than their $80 an hour expert. I wonder, and perhaps you do too, they pay their engineers back in Wichita more than $80 an hour and therefore it is not economical for them to bring their engineers in. It's cheaper for them to bring in these hired guns and tell you what you know is obviously wrong. Do you believe that as you sit here in judgment of this 300 
$27 million corporation that you're entitled to have somebody get on one of their airplanes at Wichita and come to Philadelphia International and get a cab over to Camden and tell you folks from South Jersey that their design is as good as Beach or Piper? What do you think? Do you think you're entitled to that? Of course you are. There are other things that you're entitled to that you have not been given the benefit of. But I need not detail those for you because I'm sure that you know what it is that you demand in a case of this nature and what you did not get. Damages. You saw the exhibits with respect to Mr. Guineer's earnings, his life expectancy, and I don't believe that you heard a single word in contradiction of that. Therefore, I suggest to you that this young man's family is entitled to every penny that he would have earned in his work expectancy, in addition to a few other items that I'll mention in a moment. know what a remarkable young man Joe was. And again, I'm not going to preface on your time to tell you what you already know. You know from the mere fact that after his death, that whole community gathered around the Guineers and they had a memorial for Joe. The compensatory damage aspect of this case is very clear. What is the intangible aspect about it? Because you can figure out the damages by a pencil and paper that you'll have with you without me telling you how to do that. But let me let me visit with you a moment on the intangibles. Now I'm not asking you to give damages to the mother and father of this child because of their heartbreak. You or Cessna don't have enough money to do that. But all of the things that Joe meant to this family, the, the things that you and I with our children we take for granted, taking out the trash and doing, the little things around the house, they have a value. There's even the value of knowing that in your old age that Joe will be there. And Joe was there all the time his neighbors, to his friends, and to his family. Now won't you be there? What's this case all about? The compensatory damages is not what this case is all about. That's simply an aspect of it. This case represents conduct by the largest light plane manufacturer in the world is an utter and reckless disregard of human life or safety. I told you moments ago about the burden of proof being by a fair preponderance of the evidence. That's not the burden in this punitive aspect of the case. It's not the burden at all. It's a higher burden and a burden that I am more than willing to accept as I was the lesser burden. And that's to show you by clear and convincing evidence that this company requires immediate and severe punishment now for conduct that has existed for 16 years and conduct that brought these young men to an early grave. aspect of your verdict is the punitive damages. How do you measure punitive damages? How do you say 
to a company like this, you and others similarly situated shall never do this again. Because if you do, <clears throat> you can expect this type of response from another jury in another jurisdiction at another time. Well, if I had ten dollars and you were to bring in a punitive verdict against me for a dollar, that would hurt. That would hurt a lot. And I think twice before I would put my net worth up to exposure again. But if I had a hundred thousand dollars and you were to award a punitive verdict against me of a dollar, I'd laugh at you. That's what I'd do. I'd laugh because it is cheaper for me <clears throat> to pay a punitive award of a dollar if I have a hundred thousand dollars. So I'd laugh. I wouldn't pay any attention to that. And indeed, nor would you pay any attention to it. This company <coughs> has a net worth of three hundred and twenty seven million dollars. Now I could say that there's three hundred and twenty seven million reasons why they should be punished. Now how do you arrive? How do you arrive at that figure which is going to make this company pay attention to their responsibilities for safety in the lives of people who fly, fly their airplanes. You're going to do it by bringing in a substantial, and when I say substantial, I mean substantial award of punitive damages. It should be so substantial that when your verdict is announced, as it will be tomorrow, that this lawyer sitting over there representing Cessna is going to make that other telephone call that I told you about. He's going to walk out to the telephone in the corridor and he's going to pick it up and he's going to say, Operator, get me Mr. Cessna in Wichita, Kansas. Mr. Cessna, the folks from South Jersey have arrived at their verdict. Now you talk to Mr. Cessna. You give him a message that makes his knees rubbery, that causes his heart to beat fast, and you do it in a clear, precise way. So that when your verdict is recorded and you walk out into the street and you look up in the clear skies of New Jersey and you see an airplane go over, you can say, I may have saved your life. This young boy cries out from an eternal darkness justice. Thank you.